Well, Charlie, it's as always an honor to be with you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm overwhelmed with everything that's happening. Well, thanks to you. Oh, hardly thanks <laughs> to me. You keep saying that, and that's just so wrong, Charlie. It's all because of you. I just maybe shined a teeny flashlight in your direction, but yeah. believe me, all this attention and good words are just because you so deserve it. So it's very nice that we could get together today to sort of celebrate in words how wonderful mm -hmm. you are. Yes, it is. Well, it's, uh, I don't know how to express uh, my thanks to you for making this last chapter of my life the most most interesting. Oh, well, it's my <laughs> pleasure. And uh, frankly, I really feel like I'm, I'm doing a public service because the, the, the more people that get to be in contact with your art, the richer the world becomes. And yeah, thank you. Uh, the fellow, all of your fellow Cincinnatians here have a very great pleasure upon them with this beautiful show that opens at the CAC on Friday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a place that I never expected to have a show, too, I will have to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, to me, it makes perfect sense th that you're there. I can understand as being one of the great forefathers of, of Cincinnati and design that actually whose reach has reached all over the world. It, I can see how maybe it might not felt like it, it would happen, but it is indeed happening and how marvelous yeah. that it is. Yeah. Now, what did you think when you first heard that you were going to be featured along with Malcolm Greer and the stunning Ryan McGinnis? Well, when I first, first heard that I was going, going to have a show at the Contemporary Art Center, I, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and, and I kept saying to the, to the curator, uh, Toby, are you sure you want to have this show? And he kept saying, yeah, uh, yes, I am, <laughs> more and more. Well, believe me, it took no convincing whatsoever. <laughs> now, you're a bit of a, a treasure here, sort of a secret treasure, the fact that you've been living in Cincinnati for since 1940, what, 47, 48? Yeah, 48, yeah. Amazing. So you've seen a lot of changes here. And I think what's so remarkable is that you have been working consistently in your studio here in Cincinnati for 65 years, Charlie. That's mm -hmm. incredible. Did you? What do you account to your longevity in this this remarkable <laughs> career industry? How should we refer to it? I don't know. Uh, I can't explain any of that. It's I've, I've just been fortunate in meeting people who wanted my work, and then other people saw that and wanted it too, and I've passed from hand to hand and from one <laughs> art director to another all these years and always kept busy. Well, it doesn't surprise me because I mean having had the pleasure of showing your work or presenting it to people that weren't familiar with what you did and watching their jaws drop open and their eyes <laughs> pop out their heads. It doesn't surprise me that it worked out for you like that. <laughs> now, one of the things that, besides your remarkable skill set, Charlie, is your consistency. You, One of the tenets of a great artist is his consistency through time, and that's something that you have in spades. How do you account for that? Well, I think it's because uh, early on I gave up realism completely because I, I felt it was not leading me anywhere. Just reproducing something the way nature had made it already was not giving me any kicks. <laughs> and, and then I started uh, simplifying everything. And I've done that ever since. I work flat, hard edge, and simple. And instead of trying to leave, put everything in, I try to leave everything out. <laughs> and, and that works pretty well. It sure does, because, you know, I know in your, your head and your research indicates that you're an Audubon painter. I know that you never change the forms or the colors or the shapes, and, mm -hmm. I mean, they're as precise as photographs, yeah. photographs actually. Yeah, well, I try to be to get all the facts right in the picture. I don't, I don't want to vary the colors or vary the, the, the uh, habits of the creatures that I'm um, painting and I try to find out all about the subject I can before I start to work. And how do you do that research? Oh, I've got uh, <laughs> I've got more bird guides than anybody in the country. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I learned something from you about those bird guides and the fact that you research all of them simultaneously because every artist has rendered them a little bit differently. Yeah, this is true. I, I find uh, working on birds that, that every artist has, will show me a little something that, that the others haven't. And so I've made a point of always looking at, at all of them, all the renditions of particular birds that I can find. Well, they certainly come out wildly authentic. The fact that, you know, we can 
totally understand exactly what the bird's nature is like, what they look like, but not just the birds. So many of them, I mean, your touch is united no matter what you're drawing, yeah. but the fact that you can share information so precisely and vividly with so mm -hmm. few gestures is, is really astonishing. And I, I don't know anybody else that, that has that ability. Mm. It's really something, Charlie. Mm. Now, um, I'm not sure a lot of the listeners might be familiar with how you got your start, which was right here in Cincinnati. Yes, I, <clears throat> I worked, uh, I went to art school here and met my future wife the first day in life drawing class. And that's the lovely Edie. Uh, yeah. And uh, then I was drafted into the Army in the second year. When that was over with, in World War II, I came back to Cincinnati and finished the, my training and won the first Wilder Traveling Scholarship that the Art Academy awarded. Wow. And I had all that money and no wheels, so I proposed to Edie because her father had an old Chevrolet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I bet there was probably something more to that story than her just yeah. having a car. <laughs> yeah, there is. But uh, we went west on one of the finest honeymoon honeymoons you can imagine, to the west coast, down to L.A., over to Florida, and back home in four months. In we, four months? Wow. Four months. We camped along the way to make the money last. and, and uh, it's where I came to grips with the idea of simplifying because you have to simplify a Rocky Mountain to get it on a piece of paper. So <laughs> that's, that's where it began. <laughs> You're so practical, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> Well, one of the things that astonishes me is the way you're, you're so humble and so very gracious and kind about the way you approach your work and anybody mm -hmm. that's a fan, because basically I just knocked on your door till you let me in. So <laughs> thank you for that, by the way. But the way that your eye seems to see things that nobody else's eye see. Let's, like, let's look at the Grand Canyon piece. Okay. That's a r remarkable piece that is a, a, a tapestry of incredible geometric forms and hot yeah. pinks, oranges, and golds. Now, mm -hmm. I've been to the Grand Canyon, mm -hmm. and as big as my imagination is, it didn't <laughs> quite look like that. So how does it look like that for you, Charlie? Uh, well, I, I just picked out the most dominant colors and uh, featured them. Uh, and they happen to be orange and reds. And certain times of day, there are different colors. but. Uh, and then there are great forms that the mountains inside the Grand Canyon form, going up and down with curves of all kinds here and there. Uh, you just layered it in so beautifully. I mean, you totally captured the spirit and the awe and the slightly precariousness of being right on the edge of that mm -hmm. canyon. Yeah. It's well, really something. Well, thank you. But one of the things that always startles me is when you when you approach a landscape is these beautiful modernist approaches, and then we see this little car that actually is a Model T. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's such a paradox to see this modernist approach and a Model mm, T stuck yeah. in the middle. How well, did that come about? Well, that came about because I was working for Ford Times. The, mm. the one, one of the most astonishing productions that any corporation in this country has ever produced. And it was a lifestyle magazine that Ford Motors put out, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. It was uh, it was based on the premise that if they if you show someone lots of interesting places to go, maybe they'll go there in the Fords. Ah, See, it worked, was, didn't it? It worked. <laughs> and you worked for that them for how long? For twenty years. Twenty years. Well, and, I guess uh, you had a hand in making sure America traveled well. Yeah, that's true. And their art director was a a really uh, good art director. He just handed work out and said, "Do it." And that's so, what you want. So he gave the artist yeah. freedom to express yes. themselves. And he gave he gave me a lot of interesting projects to work on, lots of freedom to do it. And one of them was uh, showing early Model T Ford cars in early touring situations. Ah. And that's how that came about. I showed them uh, in the uh, White Sands in New Mexico, and that's a great Saratoga piece. Springs, New York, in front of the Grand Union Hotel and various interesting places that people might want to visit. Well, I've seen one in the Brooklyn Bridge, I think. Yeah. Wasn't there one in California also? Yeah, there was one in, in California uh, when people used to drive to California. 
to just to dip their front wheels in the Pacific Ocean and turn around <laughs> and come back. <laughs> so you touch both waters? <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's I, I wonder if Ford had anything to do with that. It certainly sounds like the <laughs> ultimate wish list for a car manufacturer. <laughs> we'll talk people into driving coast to coast <laughs> and not staying. <laughs> well, not in addition to those illustrating those situations, you did tons of maps, which I think is just fascinating because yeah. maps are so dry and kind of dull today and hard to read. Yeah. And, well, that can be pretty interesting if you uh, if you have something hap happening on the map, something historical or something scenic that occurs somewhere on the map, you can fill up a lot of space with those with those pictures. Well, I liked the visual cues, and maybe I'm just a bit of a rube, but I really loved it because I could kind of tell how to read them in a different way than uh -huh. just trying to connect A and D to yeah. find my point. Mm -hmm. Now, Charlie, you have done so, so much through the years, and your show at the CAC that opens this Friday celebrates a good 65 years of that effort. But looking forward, which I hope you are, yeah. what would you like to do? What do you see in your future? Uh, I want to do more environmental paintings nice. to save, save the world, if possible. Good right effort. now, I'm, I'm working on uh, global warming, and uh, my mate, latest effort is a, a cardinal sitting on the head of a polar bear, Ooh. which uh, kind of sums it all up. Boy, does it ever! I'm sure yeah. it's it, it's very touching that piece because at once it's you, you're touched by how how uh, seductive the animals are, and then you realize mm -hmm. the situation, and it just kind of oh, gets mm -hmm. you in the stomach. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's for the rest of my life.